Bojo. On February 8, 1887, Congress enacted the Dawes Act. This act abolished common land ownership in exchange for individually allotted plots of land. The idea was to, overnight, turn the Indian into a farmer, and therefore an industrious man. The result of this land exchange from the common to the private was a decrease in land ownership from 138 million acres in 1887 to 48 million acres in 1934. To this day, the titular Dawes Indian rules continue to influence and determine tribal citizenship, despite the flaws in its methodology, the notoriously poor record-keeping of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and the taboo of blood quantum law apparent today. In light of the devastating consequences of the Dawes Act to Indian country, it is worth hearing the views of the opposition on this issue of land and severalty on the day it was passed. The undersigned members of the Committee on Indian Affairs of the House of Representatives are unable to agree with the majority of the committee in reporting favorably upon this bill, for these, among other reasons. 1. The bill is confessedly in the nature of an experiment. It is formed solely upon a theory, and it has no practical basis to stand upon. For many years, it has been the hobby of speculative philanthropists that the true plan to civilize the Indian was to assign him land and severalty, and thereby make a farmer and self-sustaining citizen of him. And so far, back as 1862, Congress established the policy that whenever any Indian, being a member of any band or tribe with whom the government has or shall have entered into treaty stipulations, being desirous to adopt the habits of civilized life, has had a portion of the lands belonging to the tribe allotted to him severalty in pursuance of such treaty stipulations, the agent and superintendent of such tribe shall take such measures, not inconsistent with the law, as may be necessary to protect such Indian in the quiet enjoyment of the land so allotted to him. This law stands today on the statute book as the recognized policy of this government of the United States in its dealings with the Indians. It does not make allotments of land and severalty obligatory, but recognizes the plea of those who contend for the beneficent effects sure to flow from the allotment policy. It has opened the door to its establishment, allowing any Indian in any tribe desiring to try that policy a full opportunity to do so under the protection of the government. That law has been upon the statute book for nearly 18 years, and how many Indians have availed themselves of its provisions? Manifestly, very few. And yet we are told with great pertinacity that the Indians are strongly in favor of that policy and will adopt it if they get a chance. It is surpassingly strange, if this be true, that so few have availed themselves of the privileges open to them by the Act of 1862. Being merely an experiment, it would seem to be the dictate of wisdom to take the trial of putting it into practice on a small basis, say with any one tribe that offers a good opportunity for trying it fairly. The Chippewa bands of Lake Superior, for instance, are alleged to be willing to enter upon the experiment. They have good agricultural lands, are partially civilized and educated, and are sufficiently removed from barbarism to give ground for hope that the experiment may succeed. There could be no very strong reason against trying the experiment merely as an experiment with them. But this bill, without any previous satisfactory test of the policy, proposed to enact a merely speculative theory into law, and to apply the law to all Indians except a few civilized tribes, and to bring them all under its operation without reference to their present condition. It includes the blanket Indians with those who wear the clothing of civilized life, the wild Apaches and Navajos with their nearly civilized Chippewas, and it applies the same rule to all without regard to the wide differences in their condition. It seeks to make a farmer out of a roving, and predatory Ute by the same process as it would be applied to the nearly civilized Omahas and Pancas. It needs no argument to prove that these Indian tribes vary widely from each other in their civilized attainments, but this bill ignores all these variances as if they do not exist, and erects a Procrustean bed upon which it would place every Indian, stretching out those who are too short, and cutting off the heads and feet of those who are too long. It is true that the bill leaves a great deal as to the time of putting the bill in operation to the discretion of the Secretary of the Interior, but we submit that the interests of these tribes are of too great a magnitude to be left to the discretion of any one man, even though he be a Secretary of the Interior. We know of nothing in the Constitution of that department that, that qualifies it peculiarly for such a great trust. 
Secretaries of the Interior changes frequently as the occurrence of a Mexican or South American revolution, and Congress, we think, is a safer depository for such trusts than any one man, no matter what place he may hold. Let us deal with these people intelligently and wisely, and not at haphazard. We have said that this bill has no practical basis and is a mere legislative speculation. But it may be added that the experiment it proposes has been partially tried and has always resulted in failure. In the hurry of drawing up reports, we cannot be expected to be very specific in our citations, but we may cite the case of the Catawbas, who had lands assigned them in severalty and who were protected by the inalienability of their homesteads for 25 years, just as this bill proposes. And the result was a failure, a flat, miserable failure. The Catawbas gradually withered away under the policy until there is not one of them left to attest the fact that they exist to us and their lands fell a prey to the whites who surround them and steadily encroached upon them. They were swallowed up, and the ground opened beneath their feet and engulfed them. 2. The plan of this bill is not, in our judgment, the way to civilize the Indian. However much we may differ with the humanitarians who are writing this hobby, we are certain that they will agree with us in the proposition that it does not make a farmer out of an Indian to give him a quarter section of land. There are hundreds of thousands of white men, rich with the experience of centuries of Anglo-Saxon civilization, who cannot be transformed into cultivators of the land by any such gift. Their habits unfit them for it, and how much more do the habits of the Indian, begotten of hundreds of years of wild life, unfit him for entering at once and preemptorily upon a life for which he has no fitness? It requires inclination, knowledge of agriculture, and training and farming life to make a successful farmer out of even white men, many of whom have failed at the trial of it, even with an inclination for it. How, then, is it expected to transform all sorts of Indians with no fitness or inclination for farming into successful agriculturalists? Surely an act of Congress, however potent in itself, with the addition of the discretion of a Secretary of the Interior, no matter how much of a doctrinaire he may be, are not sufficient to work such a miracle. The whole training of an Indian from his birth, the whole history of the Indian race, and the entire array of Indian tradition, running back for at least 400 years, all combined to predispose the Indian against this scheme for his improvement, devised by those who judge him exclusively for their standpoint, instead of from his from the time of the discovery of America, and for centuries probably before that, the North American Indian has been a communist. Not in the offensive sense of modern communism, but in the sense of holding property in common. The tribal system has kept bands and tribes together as families, each member of which was dependent on each other. The very idea of property in the soil was unknown to the Indian mind. In all the Indian languages, there is no word answering to the Latin habeo, I have or possess. They had words to denote holding as, quote, I have a hatchet, but the idea of the separate possession of property by individuals is as foreign to the Indian mind as communism is to ours. The communistic idea has grown into their very being and is an integral part of the Indian character. From our point of view, this is all wrong, but it is a folly to think of uprooting it, strengthened by the traditions of centuries through the agency of a mere act of Congress, or by the establishment of a theoretical policy. The history of the world shows that it is no easy matter to change old methods of thought or force the adoption of new methods of action. The inborn conservatism of human nature tends always more strongly to the preservation of old ideas than to the establishment of new ones. The world progresses steadily, but always slowly. There are singularities in the Anglo-Saxon character and peculiarities in the Anglo-Saxon belief which run back over a thousand years and which all the Enlightenment progressive centuries has been unable to overcome. There are even in our land system peculiarities which are the remnants of feudal forms and practices and which still inhere in our methods simply from the force of habit and the conservatism of forms. And if this is true of ourselves with a written history running back well nigh 2,000 years, why should we be so vain as to expect that the Indian can throw off in a moment, at the bidding of Congress or the Secretary of Interior, the shackles which have bound his thoughts 
and action from time immemorial. In this, as in all other cases, it is the dictate of statementship to make haste slowly. We are free to admit that the two civilizations, so different throughout, cannot well coexist or flourish together. One must in time give way to the other, and the weak must in the end be supplanted by the strong. But it cannot be violently wrenched out of place and cast aside. Nations cannot be made to change their habits and methods and modes of thought in a day. To bring the Indian to look at things from our standpoint is a work requiring time, patience, and the skill as well as the benign spirit of Christian statesmanship. Let us first demonstrate on a small scale the practicability of the plans we propose, and when we have done that, if we can do it, a preserving patience will be needed to make the policy general. 3. The theory that the Indian is a man and a citizen, able to take care of himself, possessed of the attributes of manhood in their broadest sense, and fully responsible to all the laws of our civilized life, a man like other men, and therefore to be treated exactly as other men, is embodied in the first part of this bill, which provides for giving every Indian a farm and leaving him then to take care of himself, because as is assumed by the framers of this bill, he is able to take care of himself. But having launched the Indian into his new course of life, the bill turns round upon itself, and assuming that the Indian is not, and will not be able to, take care of himself, at once proceeds to hedge him around with provisions, intended to prevent him from exercising any of the rights of a landowner except that of working and living on his allotment. He cannot sell, mortgage, lease, or in any way alienate his land. And although he is to be under and amenable to the laws, he is to be free from taxation for all purposes. He is to be treated as a man in giving him land and exacting from him the duty of maintaining himself upon and off of it, and all this upon the plea that he is simply a man, who is to be treated as other men are. And then, as soon as we do this, we proceed to treat him as a child, an infant, a ward of chancery, who is unable to take care of himself and therefore needs the protecting care of government. If he is able to take care of himself, all this precaution is unnecessary. If he is not able to take care of himself, all this effort to make him try to do it is illogical. If the Indian is a ward under the paternal care of government, he might as well hold his lands in common as in severalty. He cannot be made to feel the pride which a man feels in the ownership of property while he is made to feel that he does not possess one single attribute of separate ownership in the soil. In this respect, the bill is like the old Constitution of Virginia, which, when the convention which framed it put into it a clause providing a method for amending it, was said by John Randolph to bear upon its face the sardonic grin of death. The main purpose of this bill is not to help the Indian, or solve the Indian problem, or provide a method for getting out of our Indian troubles, so much as it is to provide a method for getting at the valuable Indian lands and opening them up to white settlement. The main object of the bill is in the last section of it, not in the first. The sting of this animal is in its tail. When the Indian has got his allotments, the rest of his land is to be put up to the highest bidder, and he is to be surrounded in his allotments, with a wall of fire, a cordon of white settlements, which will gradually but surely hem him in, circumscribe him, and eventually crowd him out. True, the proceeds of the sale are to be invested for the Indians, but when the Indian is smothered out, as he will be under the operations of this bill, the investment will revert to the national treasury, and the Indian in the long run will be none the better for it. For nothing can be sure than the eventual extermination of the Indian under the operation of this bill. The real aim of this bill is to get at the Indian lands and open them up to settlement. The provisions for the apparent benefit of the Indian are but the pretext to get at his lands and occupy them. With that accomplished, we have securely paved the way for the extermination of the Indian races upon this part of the continent. If this were done in the name of greed, it would be bad enough. But to do in the name of humanity, and under the cloak of an ardent desire to promote the Indian's welfare by making him like ourselves, whether he will or not, is infinitely worse. Of all the attempts to encroach upon the Indian, this attempt to manufacture him into a white man by act of Congress and the grace of the Secretary of the Interior is the baldest, the boldest, and the most unjustifiable. 
Whatever civilization has been reached by the Indian tribes has been attained under the tribal system, and not under the system proposed by this bill. The Cherokees, Choctaws, Chickasaws, Creeks, and Seminoles, all five of them barbarous tribes within a short limit of our own history as a people, have all been brought to a creditable state of advancement under the tribal system. The same may be said of the Sioux and Chippewas, and many smaller tribes. Gradually, under that system, they are working out their own deliverance, which will come in their own good time if we but leave them alone, and perform our part of the many contracts we have made with them. But that we have never yet done, and it seems from this bill we will never yet do. We want their lands, and we are bound to have them. Let those take apart and despoiling them who will. For ourselves, we believe the entire policy of this bill to be wrong, ill-timed, and unstatesmanlike, and we put ourselves on record against it as about all that is now left to do, except to vote against the bill on its final passage. Signed, Russell Errett, Chase E. Hooker, T. M. Gunter.